Hello everyone and welcome back to the Dungeon Learner's Guide. This week we've got another Commander's Guild deck tech. This is deck number 176 and it's titled Anything You Can Do, I Can Do Better. And if you haven't seen the show before, what we're doing is randomly selecting a card from scryfall.com or from among suggested cards, working with a budget of $100 or less and building a commander deck for Magic the Gathering around a theme of the chosen card. So this week, our random card comes to us from Mango Zoo over on Reddit, and that card is Leyline of Singularity, which is two blue blue for an enchantment. If Leyline of Singularity is in your opening hand, you may begin the game with it in play. All non-land permanents are legendary. So there's a couple of unique tricks to this, but the important part is that this applies to everyone. So that means if someone has anything that would make two cards with the same name, such as treasures, clues, maps, uh, this tends to apply to tokens more so than anything else, but it would force the legend rule to come into effect, meaning that they would have to sacrifice all but one of those permanents, so this can be pretty brutal for some decks to face. However, we can't guarantee that our opponents are playing those kinds of decks, so we need to build around this to the best of our ability, and that is where our commander comes in this week, because our commander is Empress Galena. And Empress Galena is three blue blue for a 1-3 legend. I believe she's a merfolk, maybe a merfolk wizard, don't quote me on that. But she has an ability that says blue blue, tap, gain control of target legend, or legendary permanent. This effect doesn't end at the end of turn. This is a permanent gaining control of something, which is... Pretty rare to come by in Magic. A lot of times it's gain control of something until the end of turn or until you lose control of the permanent or until maybe something becomes untapped. Galena doesn't have any of those restrictions. The only restriction she really has is that she has to gain control of a legendary permanent. But with Leyline of Singularity, every single permanent on the board is legendary. So yeah, we can still take someone's commander even without the ley line, but now we can take mana dorks. We can take other random artifacts or enchantments and planeswalkers. Although, again, I guess we could take planeswalkers beforehand, but you kind of get what I'm saying. The general idea is that we want to use Galena to take our opponent's things, and the ley line is going to help us make sure we can take anything. So with that in mind, let's move on to some of our themes of this deck and see what kind of ties it all together. Because obviously we can't focus just on the commander and a single card, because, you know, what if we don't have one of those two things? So the first theme we're going to talk about is going to be specifically about copying things our opponents have. One of the ideal situations for this deck is that it matches the power level of any other deck that we sit down to play with, because if our opponents are doing things, we're just going to be doing the exact same things that they are, hopefully just a little bit better to allow us to get the victory in the end. So a good example of that, and honestly kind of an unspoken MVP of the deck, is Abolith Spawn, which is 2 and a blue for a 2-3 fish horror. It's got Flash, Ward 2, and Probing Telepathy. So whenever a creature entering the battlefield under an opponent's control causes a triggered ability of that creature to trigger, you may copy that ability and you may choose new targets for the copy. So it's a very long-winded way to say that we essentially copy any enter the battlefield effects that our opponents control. So if our opponents play something that enters the battlefield and destroys an enchantment, like a Reclamation Sage, we also get to destroy an enchantment, essentially allowing us to copy the things that our opponents are doing but it's a little bit better because we don't actually have to cast the creature. We just have to have Ablet spawn in play, and because it has flash, we can kind of sneak it in under a pretty powerful ETB effect. So that is, of course, theme number one is copying what our opponents are doing, but we're probably not going to be winning the game if we're just copying what our opponents are doing, so we're also going to be taking our opponents' things because if they have them in their deck, they must be pretty powerful, so they'd probably also be pretty good under our control. And one of the good spells to highlight that is Subjugate the Hobbits, which is 5 blue blue for a sorcery. It says gain control of each non-commander creature with mana value 3 or less. Now admittedly, this isn't going to hit a lot of the big stuff, and it doesn't hit commanders no matter what, 
but it's still a great way to clear out the board in a way that people won't be expecting. Because this is going to take all of the mana dorks, this is going to take all of the little combo creatures, maybe some of the blockers that people have, and this is going to be a great way for us to just really ramp up the amount of creatures that are on our board and slowly outvalue our opponents with their own creatures. And this isn't the only effect we have like this, but it is one of the most efficient. And yes, I know that's an odd thing to say at seven mana, it's that efficient, but it's because it's one of the few cards that takes multiple creatures all at once. So that is the bulk of our deck. But of course, we have to make sure we can actually cast these cards. We have to make sure that we can steal things, copy things, take control of what our opponents are doing. And what better way to take control than to play control? So we want to be the mono blue deck at the table that always has access to interaction, counter spells, and card draw. And a great example of that, and personally one of my favorite counter spells, is negate, which is one in a blue for an instant, counter target non-creature spell. Most of the time, we're going to be using counter spells and things like that to protect what's happening on our side of the board, but they're also great ways to make sure that an opponent can't just combo off or play some huge game-winning threat without us having some interaction for it. So it's very important that we have a lot of stuff we can play at instant speed, like negate, like the Aboleth spawn. There's going to be a lot of times where we don't want to tap out completely because we kind of just want to see what our opponents are going to do and then take the best thing that they play. So even though we are playing the counter spells, like I said, a lot of times it's not to stop what our opponents are doing because we want to take their good stuff. We want them to resolve their good spells, but it's more to protect our things because if we spend a spell to take control of all the creatures on the board and someone cast a board wipe, then we're pretty sad and unable to do too much from there. But overall, that is the general idea of the deck. That is what we're aiming to do. And so the next thing I want to do is take a look at some key cards. These are cards that can be big value engines in the deck, are very important cards to the deck, and in some cases might even be win conditions. So the first key card that we're going to highlight is going to be Agent of Treachery. If we're stealing cards, this is one of the best cards we could possibly put in the entire deck because it is 5 blue blue for a 2-3 human rogue. When it enters the battlefield, gain control of target permanent. Again, that doesn't go away, just like Empress Galena's ability. But more importantly, at the beginning of your end step, if you control 3 or more permanents you don't own, draw 3 cards. This is a huge card draw engine in the deck because hopefully... We're going to have at least three permanents that we don't own every single turn, meaning we are drawing three additional cards every single turn. And that is more than enough for our deck to get out of hand, get to the point where we've got too much interaction that our opponent's going to have to fight through, being able to steal more and more things because we've been taking more and more cards. And we didn't really touch on it earlier, but we do also have copy effects that can target anything on board. So there is a chance we can copy our own Agent of Treachery, and if we have two of them and they both trigger independently, we would be drawing six cards every turn instead of three. So Agent of Treachery really is one of the best cards for this style of deck, and it is unfortunate that it's over $6 now because... It definitely puts in work that you might not expect, but I also imagine people do expect it to put in work, which is probably why it is $6, but anyway, moving on to our next key card. This one is three steps ahead, and this is a pretty recent card coming from Outlaws of Thunder Junction, but it's a card that every single deck I put it in from Commander down to Standard and Pioneer and things like that. It is incredibly efficient and incredibly useful to have in a game because, well, while it's only technically a single blue mana, it is more likely going to always be three plus mana because it has spree. It's an instant. You can pay an extra one in a blue to counter target spell. You can pay an extra three mana to create a token that's a copy of target artifact or creature you control. Or you can pay an extra two mana to draw two cards, then discard a card. So you could cast all of them in one go, but that's going to cost you about eight mana. So it's very unlikely that we do that, but not impossible. But the real draw of this card is that it's never a dead card in your hand. You're never sitting there 
wishing it were something else, because it's a counterspell, it's a card draw effect, and it's a copy effect all in one, and there's always going to be a time when we want one of those things, and honestly, we're probably going to want multiple of them quite a bit. So having the ability to play around with three steps ahead and have access to pretty much whatever you need whenever you need it is incredibly important for this deck because, like I said earlier, we kind of just want to pass, hold up our mana, and see what our opponents are doing before we make any strong decisions. But that is only key card number two. We still got one more to talk about, and this one is Lithoform Engine. And this is a card that... I wouldn't necessarily call it a pet card of mine, but it is a card that I try to squeeze into a lot of decks, and I really just find it doesn't do good work most of the time. However, I do think this deck is absolutely perfect for it because of everything that it does. So bear with me on this one. There's a lot of text here, but it is four mana for a legendary artifact. You can pay two, tap it. Copy target activated or triggered ability you control. You may choose new targets for the copy. Pay 3 mana and tap it. Copy target instant or sorcery spell you control. You may choose new targets for the copy. And pay 4 and tap it to copy target permanent spell that you control. Because we're really focused on taking control of our opponent's things, we have a lot of cards in the deck that do just that. They steal things, they copy things, and so we can't copy our opponent's things with Lithoform Engine, but we can copy our things, which are presumably also copying our opponent's things, meaning we can copy two things or steal two things when we only paid to really steal or copy one. So some of the great examples of this is, of course, we can Agent of Treachery, copy it with Lithoform Engine, boom, we have two right there. We can do this with Empress Galena, because it's going to copy the activated or triggered ability, so we steal two things when we activate her. And this is going to be incredibly powerful as the game goes on, because this deck doesn't ramp super hard, but it does try to hit its land drops every single turn because of the amount of card draw that it has. So being able to constantly activate Lithoform Engine puts our deck in a position where it's very easy to win as we're just accruing value and our opponents are struggling to stop it because we're just kind of playing their decks. So before I get too much into our key cards, that is the vast majority of what we want to talk about here. So the next thing we're going to do is take a look at some cool interactions in the deck. And these are a pair of cards that I like to highlight because sometimes they're just fun, sometimes they're cards that work in unique ways, and of course sometimes they're combo pieces that could potentially win us the game. So starting off with our cool interactions, we have Reenact the Crime and Fact or Fiction. So Reenact the Crime is another recent card coming out of Murders of Karlov Manor, and it's another card that I've found myself putting into almost every blue deck that I've been building lately because it's just never quite a dead card. There's always something you can do with it. It is one blue 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 for an instant, exile target non-land card in a graveyard that was put there from anywhere this turn, copy it, you may cast the copy without paying its mana cost. So essentially, if someone were to cast a board wipe and a giant creature goes to the graveyard, we can cast this, exile the creature out of the graveyard, and copy it, casting our own copy of it. We can also do the same thing for any spells that someone puts into the graveyard. It's incredibly efficient when we're talking about removal, counter spells, interaction, and then giant spells as well. If someone accidentally mills a giant creature or giant spell, we can just copy it. So reenact the crime really does everything we want it to be doing, and we can kind of force it to do what we want it to do by using something like Factor Fiction, which is three and a blue for an instant, reveal the top five cards of your library, an opponent separates those cards into two piles, put one pile into your hand and the other into your graveyard. So a lot of times if you're playing Fact or Fiction and your opponents know what they're doing, they'll split the piles to be maybe the one card they know you really want, and the four cards that are just kind of okay, or they might split it two and three, putting a slightly better pile in the two so you would get less cards. But with Reenact the Crime, you can factor fiction, and maybe your opponent splits the four and the one. They put the Agent of Treachery and the one, they put everything else as the four. You take the pile of four, put the Agent of Treachery in the graveyard, cast Reenact the Crime, get it for free anyway, plus you just drew an additional four cards. So 
yeah, combined, it's a total of eight mana to cast both spells, but I think you can very easily get way more than eight mana worth of value out of these two cards, especially because they're both instants. You can very easily just pass your turn, hold up a ton of interaction, and if nothing happens that you want to deal with, then you can do this at the end of an opponent's turn to make sure you untap with some massive threat or just some massive value piece that's going to eventually win you the game. And speaking of eventually winning the game, we're going to move on to our next cool interaction, which is the only infinite combo in the entire deck. That is Naru Meha Master Wizard and Ghostly Flicker. Now, before I get into this, I know that some people are not a big fan of infinite combos. Personally, I believe that most decks should have at least one, even if you don't have a way to find it, because games gotta end at some point, and I've played far too many games where my main game plan gets shut down and I need a backup, and so I've kind of started to lean on just one to two card combos that can close out the game in an emergency. So this is one of those interactions, because we have Narumeha, which is two blue-blue for a 3-3 legendary creature human wizard. She has Flash, and when she enters the battlefield, copy target instant or sorcery spell you control. You may choose new targets for the copy, and other wizards you control get plus one, plus one. The spell that we're most likely going to want to hit with Narumeha is Ghostly Flicker, which is two and a blue for an instant, Exile two target artifacts, creatures, and or lands you control, then return those cards to the battlefield under your control. So essentially, the way that this works is even if you have an empty board, you can cast Ghostly Flicker to target a couple of your lands, exile them, bring them back into play. But once that's on the stack, you can cast Narumeha, she's going to come in, you're going to copy the Ghostly Flicker, and the new Ghostly Flicker is going to target Narumeha and something else. Meaning that when that resolves, the original Ghostly Flicker is still on the stack, Narumeha re-enters the battlefield, still sees the original copy of Ghostly Flicker, and then copies it again. Essentially, this lets you blink Narumeha an infinite number of times, and because Ghostly Flicker also targets lands, you can tap the lands for mana in between every single time they're exiled and return, meaning you can just make infinite mana. Now, this doesn't outright win the game. That is something that I need to be very clear about. If you do this, don't expect people to just concede because you think you have an infinite combo, because, yeah, it's infinite, but you need something to do with it. So you need to have a creature that you can infinitely blink along with Narumeha, maybe steal an opponent's creature that can do a damage when it enters the battlefield, something like that. Being able to have a creature that draws a card when it enters so you can draw your entire deck. There are ways in the deck, once you've made infinite mana, to win the game. The biggest one is going to be Blue Sun Zenith, because you can target a player to draw cards, you make them draw their entire libraries, they lose the game, and so on. So, like I said, in infinite combo, I know some people are not a fan. If you're not, just remove one of the two pieces, or maybe both. Personally, I still think they're both pretty good, maybe just don't use them to go infinite, but still very effective, and I did want to highlight it because I know some people are not a fan of infinites, so like I said, if you don't want it, just take it out, but I think it's worth including just in case. So anyway, that is all of our cool interactions, so the final piece of our deck tech is to take a look at the price of the deck, and this week, the total deck price came out to $93.57, with the most expensive non-commander card being Narset's Reversal at blue blue for an instant, copy target instant or sorcery spell, then return it to its owner's hand, you may choose new targets for the copy. So a pretty expensive spell for what is essentially a counter spell, but a lot of times it's actually going to be much, much more than that, because if our opponents cast a giant instant or sorcery, we can return it to their hand, now they're out of mana, they essentially skip their turn, and we get the effect of the instant or sorcery. But we can also use it on our own spells as well. So if we cast a massive card draw effect, we could actually technically return it to our hand, still get the effect, and then also still have the card draw effect for another turn in case we need it. So Narset's Reversal is incredibly powerful, so it definitely deserves that $8 price tag, but it is a card that you can cut if you do need to trim down on price, because just cutting this card drops the deck to about $85, which is a much more reasonable price than $93, even though it is still pretty expensive. So 
if you're looking to trim, this is a card you can cut. There's plenty of other counter spells you can throw in that are going to do something similar a lot of the time. But I would argue that if you can keep it in, it's definitely worth the inclusion because it is incredibly powerful. On the other hand, if you're looking for a card to put into the deck that's a little bit outside of our budget range, I do have a card suggestion for you there as well. So the card that I would recommend putting into the deck, if you don't mind adding a little bit of a price tag, is Royal Elemental at $9.90. And the reason that I would recommend Royal Elemental is because it fits everything our deck really wants to be doing. It's 3 blue 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 for a 3-2 elemental, it's got flying, and it also has landfall, so whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you may gain control of target creature for as long as you control royal elemental. Now, it is a 3-2, so it can die pretty easily, but being able to just play a land and steal a creature means that we can advance our game plan much quicker when every time we're playing a land, we're stealing something, and every time we're casting a spell, we're probably stealing something. So it just really changes the flow of the game to be able to steal creatures that effectively. And like I said earlier, we really do want to hit our land drops every single turn, considering how many cards we draw. So it's not like you're ever going to be wasting a turn not playing a land. You're definitely going to be able to find lands in here if that's something you need. However, though, if you're putting a card into the deck, you would have to take a card out of the deck, and the card I would recommend taking out is Arcane Proxy, which is 7 mana for an artifact creature wizard. It's a 4-3. When it enters the battlefield, if you cast it, exile target instant or sorcery card with mana value less than or equal to Arcane Proxy's power from your graveyard, copy that card, you may cast the copy without paying its mana cost, and it also has prototype, so you can cast it for one blue blue and make it a 2-1 instead of a 4-3. Now, there's a lot going on with this card, but essentially it allows you to play a spell for free from your graveyard if it has mana value 4 or less, but that's only if you spend 7 mana on it, and then if you spend 3 mana, it's only a spell 2 or less. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but if we're being perfectly honest, most of the cards we want to be casting are going to be casting for a lot more than 2 or 4. And even if they do cast for 4, it's a tough ask to get us to 7 mana just to play something that actually costs 4 mana, and that's not really what we want to be doing. I was really hoping Arcane Proxy would be good, and if I'm being perfectly honest, I completely missed originally that it has to be cast to be able to use its effect, because I was hoping, hey, maybe we can blink it with Ghostly Flicker and kind of get a bunch of stuff back, but that doesn't even work because you can't flicker it, you have to cast it, so I do think Arcane Proxy has gone down a little bit in my opinion. That's not to say it's a bad card, there's definitely still relevance to it, and it still can do some things, so... If you have a personal experience with Arcane Proxy, I would love to hear times when it works really well. So let me know down in the comments if you've played with it and some of the good that it can do. Because I want to keep trying it and I want to keep hoping it's good, but I just never quite seem to find a good place for it. So with all of that being said, that is our deck for this week. And we're going to jump into a game and see how it actually performs in a game. But before we can get to that point, I do want to take a second to highlight some of the ways that you can help support the channel if that's something you're interested in doing. So if you would like to join our patrons and channel members, which you can listed below, we have every link down in the description of the video for you. Everything there you get access to as soon as you join, and of course if you join at the $5 level on Patreon or as a channel member, you do get access to our Discord channel where we brew up a lot of these videos, where we're brewing up the decks, we're playing the games, we get a lot of interactions going, and that's not something that you necessarily have to stick with. I understand that it is tough to have monthly payments and things like that, but if you are interested in joining and you would like to join in at the Discord level, even if it's only for a month, that gives you complete access to the Discord. So don't feel like you have to stick around, although personally I would greatly appreciate it, but that's not a necessity. So before we move on to the actual game, though, I do want to shout out all of our patrons and channel members because they are an amazing group of people. We have William Swiftfoot, Doodle, Eric Huey, Jeff Winger, Jeffrey Boos, Salty and Sunshine, Tyler Esme, Sven Van Nimwigen, Paddywhack, 
Devin Purser, Brian Haney, Keegan Tawney, and Elias Mesa. So to all of you, thank you all so much for all of your support. And without any more blabbing from me, let's get into the game for this week. So as always, we are joined by three opponents this week. The first of which is going to be Josh playing Volo Guide to Monsters. Then we have Doodle playing Dong Zhao the Tyrant. And we have Vintage playing Gerard Weatherlight Hero. So starting off with Josh and his Volo deck, this is 100% a Dungeons and Dragons deck. So every single card that's in it was printed in the D&D sets for Magic, whether that's Adventures in the Forgotten Realm or Battle for Baldur's Gate, being able to have the Commander decks along with it. So any card that was printed in either of those two sets, including their Commander decks, is eligible for this deck. So I'm very excited to see what he can do with this. Josh is a great deck builder and has a great mind for D&D as well. He's someone I play D&D with regularly. So I do hope to see a lot of that kind of show through in the deck because I think it's a super inspired build and I think it sounds like a ton of fun. Moving on to Doodle and his Dong Zhao deck. This is a deck that we've seen quite a few times on the channel. It is one that is constantly evolving and growing, and every time I see it, I get more and more scared of it. It is essentially a mono-red clone deck because he wants to play Dong Zhao, do damage to an opponent equal to the power of one of their creatures, and then keep making copies of Dong Zhao and flickering Dong Zhao and making tokens of him to be able to keep burning out his opponents. And... Like I said, every time I see this deck, it just gets more and more efficient, so I'm very excited to see what new additions he's got for it, but at the same time, this is definitely the deck that I'm the most afraid of at the table. And then finally, we have Vintage playing his Gerard deck, and this is Vintage's second game on the channel. The first game, he actually also played Gerard, so if you're interested in that, you can go back to last week's video and check that out. But Gerard is a commander that Vintage built with our Discord channel. So he recently joined the Patreon and then joined in to our Discord channel and asked for some help building a deck. And we as a group kind of decided on this build of Gerard. And so it's a deck that he's been piloting to try to get some usefulness out of to try to figure out what's going on with it. But it's very, very cool because it was built entirely out of cards that he owns. He didn't buy anything for it and it is still very powerful. So without any spoilers, if you haven't seen last week's video of the Gerard deck, definitely go back and watch it because it did some work in that game. But that is another deck to be watching out for in this game. So without any more talking from me, I hope you all certainly enjoyed the deck tech. I hope you will enjoy the game as well. I'm sure I certainly will. So once again, thank you all so much for watching, and I will talk to you all once the game is done. At the start of the game, Josh goes first, followed by Doodle, myself, and then Vintage. On Josh's first turn, he plays a Myriad Landscape. Doodle plays a Spine Rock Knoll, hiding away a card. I play an island, Vintage plays a mountain, Josh plays a Gond Gate, letting his gates enter untapped, and casts Mindstone. Doodle plays a mountain and casts Gamble, searching his library for a card, putting it into his hand, and then discarding a card at random, and in this case he discards Othorian, Hero of Lava Brink. He then casts a Soul Ring, followed up by casting a Ruby Medallion, making his red spells cost one less to cast. I play an island and cast Mirror Shield. Vintage plays a Temple of Triumph, scrying one. Josh plays an island, then sacrifices his Myriad Landscape, searching his library for two basic lands and putting them both into play tapped. Doodle plays a mountain and casts Roaming Throne, naming Human, so he doubles any triggered abilities of humans he controls. On my turn, I simply play an island and pass. Vintage plays a mountain and casts Personal Sanctuary, preventing all damage that would be dealt to him on his turn. Josh casts a Stone Speaker Crystal, then casts Skullwinder, letting him and I both return a card from our graveyards to our hands. In response, I cast three steps ahead, drawing two cards and discarding a card. Then, when the Skullwinder's trigger resolves, I return three steps ahead to my hand, while Josh returns Myriad Landscape to his hand, immediately playing it. 
Doodle casts a Mirage Phalanx, soul bonding it to Roaming Throne, letting him make a token copy of each creature when he moves to combat, except the copy has haste and is exiled at the end of combat. Since both creatures are humans, when Doodle moves to combat, Roaming Throne doubles the trigger, so he creates two copies of Roaming Throne and two copies of Mirage Phalanx. This lets him attack me for four, Vintage for four, and Josh for eight, one of which he blocks with Skullwinder, killing it and only taking four. On my turn I play an island and cast Leyline of Singularity, making each non-land permanent legendary. Vintage plays a mountain and casts Segovian Angel. Josh casts his commander Volo Guide to Monsters, letting him copy any creature he casts as long as it doesn't share a creature type with any other creature he controls or has in his graveyard. Doodle plays a War Room and casts Fire Diamond, then when he moves to combat he creates two token copies of each of his creatures, but since they're all legendary he has to sacrifice them, but this doesn't stop him from attacking me with both of the originals for eight. In his second main phase, since an opponent lost 7 or more life this turn, he's able to cast the spell hidden under Spinerock Knoll for free, casting Magus of the Wheel. On my turn, I simply play a Guildless Commons and return an island to my hand. Vintage cast Faramir Field Commander, letting him draw a card in his end step if a creature died under his control this turn, then he plays a Lotus Field, sacrificing two lands when it enters, and attacks Doodle for one with Segovian Angel. Josh cast Myconid Spore Tender, creating a copy of it on cast and destroying Leyline of Singularity when it enters. Then the original enters and destroys Roaming Throne, paying for Ward. He then cast Winged Boots and attacks Doodle for 3 with Volo. Doodle plays a Forgotten Cave, then cast Panharmonicon, doubling the Enter the Battlefield effects of his creatures and artifacts, but in response I cast 3 steps ahead, countering the spell. Once that resolves, Doodle casts a Blade of Selves, then passes. On my turn I play an Island and cast High Tide, letting all islands tap for 2 mana this turn. This lets me cast my Commander, Empress Galena, which can be activated to permanently gain control of a Legendary Permanent, and then I equip her with Mirror Shield, giving her plus 0, plus 2, and Hexproof. Vintage plays a Terramorphic Expanse and casts World Slayer before sacrificing the Terramorphic Expanse and searching his library for a basic land, putting it into play tapped. Josh plays an Island and casts Astral Dragon, copying it with Volo and creating two 3-3 Dragon tokens that are also copies of another permanent. In this case, the first dragon makes two copies of Soul Ring, and the other makes two copies of Blade of Selves. He then equips a copy of Blade of Cells to the copy of Myconid Spore Tender, giving it Myriad, and this lets him attack Doodle for four, creating another token copy of the Myconid, attacking both Vintage and myself. When the copies enter, Josh destroys World Slayer and Mirror Shield, then each of Josh's opponents take four damage, and then he sacrifices the tokens at the end of combat. On Doodle's turn, he sacrifices Magus of the Wheel, making each player discard their hand and draw 7 new cards. He then overloads a Vandal Blast, destroying all of his opponent's artifacts, and casts Sulfuric Vortex, preventing players from gaining life and doing 2 damage to each player in their upkeep. In my upkeep I take 2 damage, then I play an Island and cast Treasure Cruise, delving away 7 cards from my graveyard to draw 3. In Vintage's upkeep, he takes no damage thanks to Personal Sanctuary, then casts his commander Gerard Weatherlight Hero. He also plays a Plains, and casts Inventor's Apprentice before attacking me for 3 with Faramir. In Josh's upkeep, he takes 2 damage, then plays a Seagate, naming green when it enters so that it taps for both of his colors, and he casts his own Soul Ring, and also casts You Find a Cursed Idol, choosing to destroy target artifact, destroying Doodle's Blade of Selves. After that he moves to combat, and attacks Vintage for 6 with an Astral Dragon, and attacks Doodle for 8 with both of his Myconids. In Doodle's upkeep he takes 2 damage, then he plays a Mountain and casts Helm of the Host, 
followed up by casting Underworld Breach. This gives all of the spells in his graveyard escape 3, and he immediately exiles 3 cards from his graveyard to cast Gamble, searching his library for a card, putting it into his hand, then discarding a card at random, specifically discarding Wheel of Misfortune. Then he's able to exile 3 more cards from his graveyard to cast the Wheel of Misfortune, making each player choose a number at the same time, and each player who chooses a number that's not the lowest discards their hand and draws 7, while each player who chooses the highest number takes that much damage. When the numbers are revealed, Josh, Vintage, and I all choose 0, taking no damage, but also not wheeling our hands, while Doodle chooses 4, taking 4 damage and discarding his hand to draw 7 new cards. Once that's all resolved, Doodle casts Blasphemous Act, doing 13 damage to each creature. In response, I activate Empress Galena to gain control of Doodle's Helm of the Host, and still in response, Josh casts Blur, exiling Mykonid Sportender, drawing a card, then returning it to play, destroying Ruby Medallion. Then, the board wipe resolves, destroying all creatures, but since Gerard died, Vintage can exile him and return all of his creatures that died this turn to the battlefield. Once all of that has resolved, Doodle exiles another 3 cards from his library to cast Gamble, again searching his library for a card, putting it into his hand, and discarding a card at random, this time discarding a mountain. Finally at the end of turn, Doodle is forced to sacrifice the Underworld Breach, and I cycle a remote isle. On my turn, I take 2 damage and play an island. Vintage plays a plains and casts Moonshaker Cavalry, giving all his creatures plus 4 plus 4 and flying when it enters, since he controls 4 creatures. He attacks Josh for 17 with all of his creatures, and at the end of turn, Josh sacrifices his Myriad Landscape to search his library for 2 basic lands, putting them into play tapped. In Josh's upkeep, he takes 2 damage, then plays a Basilisk Gate and casts Ancient Silver Dragon, letting him roll a d20 when it deals combat damage to a player, drawing cards equal to the result, and gaining no maximum hand size for the rest of the game. In Doodle's upkeep, he takes 2 damage, then plays a Sanctum of Eternity, and casts Trumpeting Carnosaur, discovering 5 when it enters. In response though, I flash in Aboleth Spawn, allowing me to copy any of my opponent's Enter the Battlefield effects. This means that I also get to discover 5, with mine resolving first and letting me cast Lithoform Engine for free from the top of my library. Then Doodle's Discover Trigger resolves, letting him cast a Cursed Mirror from the top of his library. He then has the mirror enter as a copy of Trumpeting Carnosaur, meaning he discovers 5 again, while I get to once again copy the trigger. When the triggers resolve, I put Twin Cast into my hand, while Doodle puts Dual Caster Mage into his hand. Once all of that resolves, Doodle casts an Ensnaring Bridge, preventing creatures with power greater than the number of cards in his hand from attacking, which is currently 4, then he also casts Smoke preventing players from untapping more than one creature in their untapped steps. At the start of my turn, I take 2 damage, then I play an island, cast Sky Diamond, and pass. On Vintage's turn, he plays a Sundown Pass and casts Hactos the Unscarred, randomly choosing 3 when it enters and giving Hactos protection from everything except things with a mana value of 3. He then moves to combat and attacks Doodle for 1 with Segovian Angel, and attacks me for 3 with Faramir. In Josh's upkeep he takes 2 damage, then casts You Meet in a Tavern, looking at the top 5 cards of his library, revealing any number of creatures from among them and putting them into his hand. This has him put Acidic Slime and Underseller Myconid into his hand, and he then casts the Acidic Slime, destroying Doodle's Ensnaring Bridge when it enters. Thanks to my Aboleth, I get to copy the ability, also destroying Sulfuric Vortex. With the Ensnaring Bridge now gone, Josh is free to attack Doodle for 8 with his Ancient Silver Dragon, rolling a 13 on a d20 when it deals combat damage, drawing 13 cards, and gaining no maximum hand size for the rest of the game. In his second main phase, Josh casts Underseller Myconid, creating a 1-1 Saproling token when it enters the battlefield, which means I also get to create a 1-1 Saproling token.
On Doodle's turn, he cast his commander, Dong Zhao the Tyrant, entering the battlefield and having Ancient Silver Dragon do damage to its controller equal to its power, which is 8. Unfortunately for Josh, I get to copy this ability, also having the dragon do 8 damage to him, knocking him out of the game. After that, Doodle cast Valakut Awakening, putting two cards from his hand on the bottom of his library and drawing that many cards plus one, then attacks me for seven with the Carnosaur. During blocks, I cast Mirror Match, creating a token copy of each creature attacking me that comes into play blocking the original. This means I get a Trumpeting Carnosaur, discover five, and put Blue Sun's Twilight into my hand. Then damage happens with both Carnosaurs dying while I take one from Trample. In Doodle's second main phase, he casts Chain Reaction, doing 8 damage to all creatures since there are 8 creatures in play, completely wiping the board except for Hakdos. In response though, Vintage cast Improvised Club, sacrificing Segovian Angel to do 4 damage to Doodle, then the board wipe resolves. On my turn I play a Scavenger Grounds, Vintage plays an Evolving Wilds and recasts his commander Gerard, then attacks Doodle for 6 with Hakdos, knocking him out of the game. At the end of turn, I cast Blue Sun Zenith for X equals 5, activating Lithoform Engine to copy the spell, drawing a total of 10 cards and shuffling it back into my library. On my turn, I cast Dig Through Time, delving away 6 cards to help cast it, and also activating Lithoform Engine to copy the spell. This lets me look at the top 7 cards of my library and put 2 of them into my hand, with the rest going on the bottom. Then, since I copied it, I get to repeat the process putting two more cards into my hand. Once both spells have resolved, I cast a Soul Ring and pass. Vintage plays a Plains and casts a Bag of Holding, immediately activating it to draw a card and discard a card. Then, once that's resolved, he also casts Sneak Attack, letting him pay a red mana to put a creature from his hand into play with haste, sacrificing it in the next end step. He moves to combat and attacks me for 9 with Hakdos and Gerard, but before damage, I cast Aetherize, returning all attacking creatures to their owner's hands so I don't take any damage. On my turn I play an island and cast Ghostly Flicker, exiling two of my lands and returning them to play. In response to that, I also cast Naru Meha, Master Wizard, copying the Ghostly Flicker when she enters and choosing new targets for the copy. This allows me to exile a land and Naru Meha, returning them to play, tapping the land for mana, and then using the new Naru Meha trigger to copy Ghostly Flicker again. With this, I'm able to infinitely copy the spell and therefore create infinite mana. Eventually, I can change both targets to lands, breaking the loop and allowing me to cast Solve the Equation, searching my library for an instant or sorcery, in this case Blue Sun Zenith, putting it into my hand. Finally, I cast the Blue Sun Zenith for X equals as much as I want, targeting Vintage to force him to draw his entire deck, knocking him out, and winning me the game. Alright, so that was a sweet game. Definitely a lot going on in this game. I think that the kind of unspoken MVP for our deck was the Abeloth spawn. I haven't really played with it too many times, but every single time I do, it really just shows its power over and over again, copying into the battlefield effects. And people don't typically want to kill it because it is just a 2-3 that's just kind of sitting there. Plus it has Ward 2, which makes it harder to kill. So it really does accrue a ton of value. I think overall, our deck did very, very well. We definitely played well at the draw-go style of gameplay. Just drawing, playing a land, passing, holding up interaction, holding up counter spells, removal. And then if none of that happens, we still have card draw to lean back on. So... I was very happy with the deck. I know I've been vocal in the past about mono blue being one of my least favorite mono colors. I'm not going to lie to you, it's kind of started to turn around. I think I've built enough mono blue decks for the channel at this point that I'm kind of becoming a fan of it, so I'm not sure if I'm getting corrupted by blue or what's happening there, but I think the deck was a ton of fun. I think it really played well and had a lot of intricacies to it. So if you're interested in picking up this deck, I would love to hear your own opinions of how it can do. Let me know down in the comments too if there's any cards you think we should add to the deck, if there's any cards you think that aren't good enough for the deck. I love hearing people's opinions on what to include and what not to include. So definitely a ton of fun. And of course, we got a win, which is always nice. Um, moving on though, talking about everybody else's deck... 
Vintage's deck also did very well. I think, unfortunately, he struggled with not getting any engines going. There were enough board wipes that he couldn't really come back from. He was able to bounce back from one, but when there's two and then an Aetherize, it really just becomes difficult for the creature-based deck to do too much, unfortunately. Josh's deck also kind of struggled a bit. I think that he struggled more than he wanted to admit initially from the Leyline of Singularity, and then once he realized how much it was going to mess up his deck being able to copy things with Volo, he made the decision to blow it up, which personally I think Doodle was suffering from it more in that specific instance, so I don't know how great that one was for him, but I think that by the end of the game, if it weren't for, well, the Abolith, like we talked about earlier, I do think Josh probably would have started to pull ahead and start winning, mainly thanks to that Ancient Silver Dragon. So it was really cool to see a D&D focused deck do some very impressive things. And there were some cards that he played that I really hadn't seen too much. A lot of the adventures were very, very cool. So very nice showing from Josh. And then of course, finally, we have Doodle and his Dong Zhao deck. Being able to slap some people around didn't get quite as much slapping from Dong Zhao as he would like. Being able to get him down late in the game and use him to knock out Josh was pretty effective, but at that point he only had six life left and just fell to Hactos pretty soon after, so not necessarily what he wanted to be doing, but I do think Doodle controlled the vast majority of the game, and I think that him kind of becoming Arch Enemy early on meant that we were able to kind of slowly build up our forces and slowly draw cards and get a little bit of the aggro pushed off of us until people took out Doodle, and then we were kind of able to just clean up the pieces. So I think our deck really highlights how capable it is at doing stuff like that. But overall, let me know what you guys think of the game. Let me know if there's any improvements you think that we could make to the deck, or maybe even to the deck tech or the gameplay. I would always love to have suggestions for future improvements. So thank you all so much for watching. Please do like the video and subscribe if you have gotten this far. I would really appreciate it. But with all of that being said, thank you all so much again, and I will see you all on the other side of the Dungeon Learner's Guide.